Hey everybody, welcome to our weekly ecosystem office hours. I'm your host Jinx, and as always, joined by the best and brightest in the pocket ecosystem. Uh, one quick announcement to make this morning. I had a few people reach out uh, in regards to asking about uh, the relays going through Nodi's portal. Uh, since they, uh, on pocket scan, they appear to have dropped off to zero. And of course, there's a, uh, uh, a correlating uh, drop off in total relays for the day as well. Um, talked to Blade this morning, and he just said that they are going through some uh, QoS testing and making sure that uh, everything is up to speed uh, on uh, all of their throughput. And they've essentially fallen back to their own version of an altruist network. So there's no impact on pocket relays being served, and there's no uh, additional costs or anything being incurred on those public endpoints. Uh, it's just operating outside of the uh, pocket scan tracking while they're uh, doing some QoS testing and such. Um, and from there, we'll shift to Shane with some protocol updates. That's me, actually. I'll be taking yeah, over yeah, the protocol. Yeah, yeah, I'll take this. Yep. All right, well, Fred. Uh, cool. Uh, on the protocol side, uh, we're about halfway through the utility and tokenomics iteration. Uh, huge shout outs to Shane and Ramiro for all their help there. It's been super helpful and helps us push through that. So exciting work being done. Um, this week, we're planning on doing a regenesis to avoid some breaking uh, consensus breaking changes on, on the current testnet. So look out for that one. Um, Alpha testnet three is still planned for mid-August. Uh, which should be the the final, once and final, regenesis before we shift over to beta testnet. And uh, more details on the beta testnet are to come in later September. Fantastic. Good update there. And then uh, gateway updates. Uh, Fred, since you're here, you want to... <laughs> do you have any gateway updates for growth? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, from the portal side, uh, we have successfully downsized and deprecated all infrastructure outside of the primary three regions, which are U.S. East in Virginia uh, or South Carolina, take your pick, um, Frankfurt and Singapore. So we only operate in those three regions. It hasn't really affected much um, on our end in terms of load or demand, although we have seen like slight increases for latency on the fringes for some users so um it, it's all within tolerable range uh we are also going through a reevaluation uh, of our pricing tiers offered in the portal and we should be going live with a new set of pricing on september 1st so look out for that excellent and uh sasquatch you guys got any updates Oh, that's funny. I didn't know Discord on mobile hit the buttons uh, <laughs> until you start them. Um, yeah, sorry about the delay. Uh, just a really quick one is that we do indeed have a new chain that we're going to be bringing on the network. Um, goes by the name of Bitfinity. Um, this is like just got figured out early this morning. Um, so we're not ready to like, you know, go into the whitelisting process or anything, but just calling it out as there be a new chain in the coming weeks uh, that we're bringing on. And that's basically it from our end. Beautiful. And uh, do you guys, uh, do you have uh, uh, bootstrapping support already in place for that? Uh, we do not. Um, yeah, we haven't even, we haven't started that process yet. Um, been talking to a couple of node operators. Um, any node operators on the phone right now, I'd actually really love to interview you. I'm just slowly reaching out to um, parties to better understand um, your economic models and your considerations, your businesses, so that, you know, we can align directly. And then also we have another, like, project in the background that um, is coming in the, the later future um, that'll have direct impact. So the short answer is no, we do not have the support. If you're interested, um, please reach out. And then also, if you'd be willing to share your experience and reach out uh, to me directly. Excellent. Yeah, you can uh, click on Sasquatch's name and uh, shoot him a DM in here if you like. Uh, I don't see any of the other gateways on the call currently. Does anyone have any gateway updates that I've missed on?
Okay. I think we're good on that front then. So, unlike the last uh, three weeks in a row, we don't have a, a fixed agenda today. So, I'll open it up here for uh, anybody uh, from the floor. So, feel free to come off mute and uh, bring up questions, topics, or anything else you like. Uh, I'll keep it rolling since I have a few updates from Groves. And so, with the recent having a hard time like... hearing your friend. Oh, sorry. Let me move my mic closer. Is that better? Perfect. Okay. Um, with the uh, recent changes at Grove and our change in direction, uh, our mission is to enable gateways. Um, and so with that, we will be moving forward with creating an open source offering based on the portal middleware. Uh, we're really excited about this. As part of that, we will be migrating the existing portal to be using this open source stack uh, as it is available. And as we have more and more information, we will definitely be public and sharing more about that. Uh, the best way right now, and as we get up and running, you'll bear with us that it's a little sparse. Follow along. We'll be on GitHub uh, in our new GitHub organization, which I will link in the chat, but it is Build with Grove. So very excited about this. We're really, uh, really eager to kick this off and uh, push out and hopefully enable more gateways. Beautiful. Other topics or updates? I have one, um, I, just a general topic. Shane, this is kind of aimed at you in a, just the curious where you stand on this. And uh, this is kind of piggybacking on something that we're doing at Grove and something that um, Sasquatch just mentioned. Um, so we've, uh, I think everyone here is aware that we have this chicken and egg problem with new chains. Um, so whenever a new chain comes online, the gateway tends to bootstrap it for one to three months, unless there's some type of deal that enables it to be bootstrapped for longer. Um, and then if enough traffic, dedicated traffic isn't pushed through the network and uh, enough quality of service relays aren't done, um, on top of that, those nodes tend to not get, gain the adoption because the rewards just aren't there, which makes sense. And those chains tend to just either live on with quality of service relays to some degree, or they just die off. So in the, right, in the shift that we're doing at Grove, right, with reduce staff, um, we're, trying to, we're trying to figure out how to best operate in keeping the existing portal alive, right? Because our, our goal is still to maintain it, to drive as much traffic as we can. Um, hence the pricing changes that we're going to be making, which we're planning on making this quarter anyway. Um, we're just pushing it up by a month. Um, what the other thing that we're doing is we're also stop, uh, uh, closing access on our end to a few chains and Effectively, those chains are going to die um, because none of the other gateways currently support them. So those chains are ZK Sync, Optimistic BNB, Moon River, Moonbeam, um, and OKX, OKT, whatever it's called these days. Um, and the reason is there is this threshold between the amount of quality of service relays that our gateway can send and what it actually costs to keep a node up and running. And for something like ZK Sync and Optimistic BNB, we did have paying customers, but they were sending on the order of hundreds of thousands of relays. And that was all the relays that those specific customers were getting. Um, so that's all that they could send us, but that is not enough for a node runner to keep up and running. But then the price of keeping those nodes up and running themselves was costing us a couple grand or more per month. So there was really no benefit to us as Grove to right, charge a customer what we're charging. And again, we're trying to lower our prices them only sending everything they possibly can and then still paying way more out of pocket plus the burn to keep those chains up and running. Um, so one of the things I thought about a year ago and at that time the, that foundation decided they didn't want to do it. But um, right, Shane, you may have a different approach and the community might have a different approach. The thought process is for a period of time, it might be wise if the foundation pays for the bootstrapping of chains um, right, they can work out a deal with a specific node runner for a period of time, and that chain can be up and uh, up and running, and the different gateways could potentially keep pushing traffic, and the foundations could potentially go out and continue working on grants with other existing foundations, which I know PNF did. I know Grove had done that as well. I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts here on 
what you all think is a good approach right now to keep these long tail chains alive, given that it's really difficult to get some demand from some customers who themselves tend to give 100% of their demand to us. Yeah, my uh, yeah. my first thought is uh, what's what's needed foremost is just Gandalf going through. Which um, this by the end of this week, I'm hoping to release uh, basically like a guide. Um, it won't be quite as in depth as what I was originally planning with the proposal, simply because I've got a lot more responsibilities on my plate right now. But uh, but just kind of a general guide and then uh, potentially a spreadsheet or a way for node runners to organize themselves into chains. Um, ideally, we want to have at least two node runners uh, in each um, in each chain. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to put more um, burden on node runners than necessary. So, by allowing there to be a level of kind of like self-organizing, uh, people can kind of know how many nodes uh, you know they can put on each chain and identify which chains they want to keep running. Um, you know, ultimately, you could let this happen in a completely free market fashion where there's no coordination, and then you know chains are going to drop, and there's going to be bad quality of service because. Uh, you know, too many providers jumped on one chain and not enough on another chain. So the idea here is just to help with the transition. Now, what that will do is that will enable any new chain um, to be really efficiently run by really anyone uh, because they ultimately would only need to run one node, uh, you know, one chain node. Um, and they don't have to run 15 chain nodes anymore. So. Uh, we could allow specialists potentially in those communities to join. So I, so if we want to get to the problem, that's that's a big part of the problem is uh, we don't have independent node runners that are just spinning up uh, chains because there's a lot of potential on them. Uh, when we go to one chain uh, per pocket node, that really opens up that opportunity. So that'll be really cool. Now, in terms of the foundation funding, uh, you know, new chains right now, that's not a possibility. And part of the reason, part of the possibility in the past was a lot of times when new chains were brought on, it was through some kind of contract, uh, you know, and, and so there was an upfront payment that, you know, gateways were receiving when bringing on a new chain. So, uh, so then having PNF pay for all the infrastructure uh, you know, out of uh, out of our budget was just not feasible. Uh, from my understanding, that's that's the reason that they incentivize gateways to essentially bootstrap the initial launch of these chains. Um, yeah, going to you know, kind of a new world where you know maybe we want to add chains more efficiently. Uh, you know, without you know having to deal with uh, or or instead of gateways doing it with, where they're you know charging. Uh, for like an onboarding fee or something like that, and we want the the DAO to uh, or PNF to pay for that. That's something that's obviously possible in the future. Um, we were actually kind of thinking of uh, back when we launched community chains. That would be a a, a way that um, you know some new chains could be bootstrapped uh, in kind of a uh, uh, you know distributed fashion. Um, and then once it gets enough relays, and that's where it then becomes uh decentralized through through uh by the protocol fully supporting that chain so anyways i'm open up to those ideas uh the first step is addressing gandal and then the second step uh ultimately will be figuring out budget for something like that because right now that's you know there yeah there, there's no way that pnf can uh fund um fund these kind of you know uh infrastructure sunk cost initiatives right now um yeah i'm 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 heavily involved with trying to figure out sustainability for pnf right now uh because i am pnf right now so uh anyway so looking into options and uh uh it looks like there's some uh uh there's a positive path forward with uh bringing in some extended runway for pnf so i'm just looking into all this right now 
and figuring it out. But at least in immediate Arthur, yeah, that's not a that's not a possibility to have stables going to um, uh, you know funding infrastructure costs. Sure, that's fine. I was I it was more of a since right you're currently PNF, and if the proposal goes through, you're part of PNF. I wanted to understand where your mind was going, where your mind was. Um, uh, and uh, just some, a little more color. So there are certain customers where they will approach us before they do their testnet or mainnet launch. And we're able to kind of get either a grant or an airdrop or something or another uh, where we can launch the chain. Most of the chains that we do launch are just coming way after the fact because we're seeing adoption, right? We can probably, you know, all the Sepolia chains, the Solana chain um, and a few others were things that we launched because there was traffic that we saw, right? Blast is a great example of one that actually just organically has all that demand, um, at least from the set of customers that we have. Um, uh, but okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna press on this right now, but I know, I'm glad that it's not off the table completely. I'm glad that it's something we can talk about in the future where PNF is more silent. Well, and Thanks. like I said, the, the main problem was is these chains have no way, there, there's no path to profitability because, uh, because of, of how the system is with, uh, with 15 chains uh, for one I, I agree. So I know, once there, we there address is a that, I, I, I figure there's actually going to be quite a few strategies that are then going to be possible uh, once we're down to one, uh, one chain per, per node. So that's why... This week, I'm prioritizing trying to get basically this kind of guide and self-organization, uh, you know, form uh, out there so that we can start moving this forward, hopefully, um, yeah, within the first uh, uh, week or two here in August. What is, so aren't there specific changes, parameter changes that need to happen? And then I guess all the node runners are going to have to make decisions. I mean, they're going to make decisions on what they want to support at that There's point. One... And then... There's one parameter that needs to be changed, and that's max chains. So it's, are we also it, going to be changing the number of minimum amount of nodes in a session at that point as well? Uh, I mean, having... I'm, I'm open to hearing. I'm open to hearing any thoughts on on these these kind of things. Um, yeah, I'm I'm open to, to to hearing. The original proposal was just to change max chains. It did not include uh, uh, changing session numbers or or anything like that. Um, now, and actually this, this might, this might be a good question for, for someone else on the call closer to the protocol. If, uh, if a session, uh, doesn't, if, if there's not enough nodes on the network for a given chain to get in a session, does that, uh, does that session not even generate or does it just generate, you know, with 10 nodes instead of, uh, I think 24 is the, uh, uh, is the standard right now? Does anyone know how that works? Um, I think I believe in the past. Uh, I think Grover have reached out a couple of times. If they don't have that twenty-four nodes, I believe the session does not get generated. Okay, so the session. Yeah, if the session doesn't even get generated. Once we get closer to, um, uh, once we get closer to. One, which again, we're we're doing it in a progressive fashion. You might need to change max chains uh, to, yeah, to 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 make it to make it easier, uh, to make it actually possible because some will require less than twenty four nodes. Um, it's not a lot of them, but there there would be some that require less than twenty four nodes. Um, so yeah, at that point, we either have to figure out, hey, do we want to drop a chain or do we want to um, yeah, drop a chain or uh, change back or change uh, minimum nodes per session. So, Ramiro had said, if if I recall correctly from my local net, I had single nodes per session without touching that parameter. Uh, that definitely sounds like something that we need to be testing out in in Shannon to be sure that that's actually working as as expected. This is a topic that that we've actually, I think, a number of us have spent some time on discussing. Uh, you know, sort of. I, I guess, casually trying to see what a good strategy might be for moving forward. Because we look at, like, um, I think uh, DevDAO is bringing on Tyco, maybe, I think uh, was one of them. 
and we look at new chains that don't necessarily have a lot of traffic on them already um how how do we incentivize participation in an extremely low traffic or new chain and um the inverse of that how do we keep um new chain spamming from happening uh you know for people who are solely uh, uh, noted up on that you know if i've got 50 nodes on my new jinx chain and i'm the only one sending traffic across it and i'm the only one staked to it right then uh well, I mean, uh, why is new chain spamming bad? It's bad because that's a method of gaming the system, essentially. If, is it if gaming, I'm... though, if someone has to pay for the burn for it? Like, if you're generating both the supply and the demand and you're pay paying for the burn, then, like, are you gaming? I, I just think that this is a false, like, premise. And if this gaming is possible, then this is a tokenomics issue, not an issue with the idea that a node runner could also be the cheap demand supplier to the network. Well, it is gaming, and that is I agree with you. <laughs> that that that's why Shannon's tokenomics is designed the way it is, so that you can't do uh, small small chain gaming. Yeah, okay. if we're extracting pocket tokens in a mission as node relay rewards, and I've set up a circular system by which I'm the only set of nodes on the network, and I'm the one spamming the network with requests for that. That's essentially just printing pocket for no real benefit to the network or the ecosystem at large. But right then, like as soon as you start spamming those relays, then other node runners should theoretically come in and take some of those relays and start to win some of those rewards. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I can see I can see that as a positional argument, but you know, I, I can just I'll explain disagree. that. Like, I will say this confidently because I analyze this all the time, and and like we've launched fifty chains. Uh, they're like the top or the bottom thirty chains only exist and have been successful because our gateway spawns excess relays to test for QoS. And prior to actually, even when I was here, we had a system called the Settlers which was literally a script running on a cron job in AWS that would spam hundreds of thousands of relays on new chains to make sure that the node runners would come and stake for them. So like fake traffic is and always has, quote unquote fake traffic is and always has been a thing. And it has been a net benefit because offering the long tail of chains has been a net benefit for Pocket. And the core metric that everyone looks at every day and, and obsesses over is how many relays are we doing today? Are we cresting a billion? And so if those are quote unquote fake or not fake or whatever they are, then does it really matter? I should add that. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. All I was going to say is the definition of fake also needs to be removed. Like Fred and I have philosophize about this excessively for a better part of the year. Um, if you pay the burn, it does not matter if it's fake or not at that point. Some, you are always paying. Someone is always paying. And therefore, it is real traffic, even if it looks like it could be spam or not. And as Fred said, like we made the decision last week uh, basically to keep another 15 chains on that are currently be, basically being held alive by our quality of service uh, setup. Um, there is a world where we can just flip the switch and turn all those off if we really want to. If we really want to kind of keep everything as honest as possible. Um, and and we're not doing a lot that of right. money in the process because it costs cycles on compute on our resources every time we send QoS relays. So it would be a major but we also know, savings. But we also know there are customers that we can retain because we can offer all of these long tail chains. So they will give us the Ethereum and the Polygon and the Solana traffic if they're also able to service Sepolia testnet on base, something like that. Um, and so that's why we have to keep, we do keep these on sometimes. It's just for the sake of the customer. Um, and it, this does go into the theory um, th that we did, that Fred did mention. It's the long tail of chains that actually is useful for pockets. So by us making the decision to shut down ZK Sync and Moon River and Moonbeam, we don't make it lightly, but it is burning a hole in our pocket um, and keeping these up and running. I guess so. I, I'll put this question out to Shane then. So to clarify, I won't use the word fake since clearly they are a real relay. Um, but really what we're talking about is 
non-organically uh, generated traffic, which is intended for self-dealing. Uh, and I know, Shane, you've you've talked about some mechanisms in Shannon to help reduce or prevent self-dealing. Can, can you weigh in on that? So, yeah, I mean, the, the barrier to entry, the reason we haven't had as much self-dealing recently is because if someone did want to do self-dealing, they would have to give up their credit card information uh, to a company like Rove. Uh, and so it's basically like straight KYC, right? Um, and most, and, and the big, all, all the, you know, node runners right now, you know, they're basically KYC, you know, like it, it it's not hard to triangulate. Uh, so, um, so that has just kind of been a social, uh, 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 factor that has, I believe, been the reason that people haven't been just coming in and spamming relays. Back in the day when Grove was not charging uh, and they would pretty much just process any traffic, a huge amount of the network was just minting excess tokens um, from just sending relays to essentially their own nodes uh, through through Grove, right? And once Grove added payment and the burn, uh, that you know dramatically reduced it, right? Um, so if so, we're we're, we're kind of getting to a point though with uh, with Morris with maybe some other gateways coming on board and things of that nature, um, especially something like uh, uh, Porter, which uh, I don't believe they actually you know, require any kind of KYC because um, I believe their payments are going to be happening through smart contracts. So, uh, so we'll kind of be revisiting that place to where people could start re, uh, you know, sending, sending traffic to their own, uh, basically capitalizing on a small chain and then just sending tons of traffic that way. The problem right now is there is no cap on the amount of tokens that someone can burn with that um with that uh with that kind of system um and especially once we get to uh max chains being one uh you know well actually yeah i actually i'm not entirely sure if max chains being one that that actually might make it less likely that people could do it for a sustained manner but um anyways nevertheless uh well, we would get to a point where people could do flash, basically flash sending. They could just, you know, do a, a smart contract, pay for a certain amount of relays, and get 13,000 uh, 13, percent return on that burn. Because essentially, with right now where it is, that's how much of return you get burn versus reward in Morse. 13,000 percent return. So that's absolutely worth the burn. Um, and especially if you can do it in a, you know, anonymous fashion, then there really wouldn't be anything preventing, uh, you know, these kind of these kind of gaming. Now, yes, as Fred's saying, it makes relays go up, right? It technically is adding burn to the network, right? Um, but what it's doing is because, at least with the current economic model, there's only 220,000 pocket minted a day, basically, right? So. Anytime there's a, a, a shift in the amount of traffic going on a chain, uh, that means rewards from other chains are now being directed to this chain because it's all distributed across all chains. So 220,000 distributed all, across all chains. If someone decides, hey, I want to do you know 200 million requests uh, on a, a small chain that no one else is on, uh, you know, like right now, that would be half of the network. So half of that 220 would go directly to one node runner, literally in, in, you know, within a day, right? Um, that's the kind of gaming that is possible, which is the reason that we've never allowed app stakes to just be controlled by anyone because you could do it in a fully permissionless fashion. Um, we're kind of getting to that point now with potentially new gateways where you could. So. Uh, so while, while, you know, we can say that, yeah, it hasn't been a problem, you know, like a crazy problem in the, you know, in the past since growth started charging folks, 
Um, well, also, Grove charges significantly more than the burn. So it also, it, it just depends on, uh, uh, yeah, you wouldn't get 13,000 because Grove is charging more than the burn. So it, it is dependent on whatever the rate is of the of the gateway. But I mean, ideally, or in most all cases, because we're minting 13,000% 13, uh, 13, more than the, uh, than the burn um, per relay, yeah, there, there's definitely going to be opportunity for gaming. So that's at least my thoughts on it. Yeah, I'd like to comment on this. This is something that I've been thinking about for a little while. I mean, until you get to the point where um, the, like uh, Arthur said, it, 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 if everything's paid, it's a, it's a non-issue. Uh, but, but that is only true when the new tokens minted are offset by the tokens being burned, um, which isn't the case now that's the goal right so until you get to that point um like fred said more traffic is better i, I would push back on that and and add uh more paid traffic is better uh but more traffic by itself is not better because more traffic that's not paid just increases supply and the more supply there is theoretically you know economics the less valuable the token is and so um that's kind of my high level thought on this whole thing. But until we get to that point where uh, anything that's minted is offset by paid traffic, I, I think there is a risk of, of just like letting on long tail because long tail is only good if it is eventually profitable. That's my opinion. Yeah, and there's a hell of a margin between the burn and, and new mint, so there's a strong incentive to self-deal. Yeah, exactly. And and having like PNF pay for new uh like new long tail, I, I think that's extremely risky. And that's one of the things like I, I don't think that I, I don't think that it's a, a great business practice to for example, like charge gateways for for new chains coming on. I think that you know, from a from a network development perspective, it probably is better to have you know PNF grants for new chains to some level of traffic or something along that line, um, you know, to help to help drive demand. And I think that a couple of the ideas that Shane was working on to uh help incentivize on the network side itself from the new ch the new chain side um also is a way to to help um drive that because then it it essentially reduces the cost of the burn that they pay while they're a new network and getting their feet under them um and, and maybe even you know turn a profit on that to some degree uh versus making it harder for gateways to do new chain business development uh, but this is definitely one of those things that needs to be looked at from all directions, in my perspective. Yeah, it's a tricky balance, right? Because you want to make it as like easy and painless as possible for any of the new chains. Um, but at the same time, because the effectively like the carry cost of of every chain is not zero, you can do a long tail a long tail model if the um, the, the carry cost is zero. You know, kind of like uh, I don't know, like uh, iTunes adding new songs. It's it's a different deal there because effectively to add like a new song to make that long tail model work, their their costs to keep that song available is zero effectively. But that's right. not the case with a chain. So you really you could never have a long tail model with the way things work in uh like the pocket ecosystem. But like you're saying, Jenks, you you have to have some uh like painless way of onboarding new chains because the the bet is that some percentage of those is is going to grow and, and that's what you're after but it's not 100 percent it, it's probably some minority percent you know like the 80 20 rule greater principle whatever you want to call it but you know some might small minority in terms of the number of chains is going to generate the majority of the traffic i mean just look at it now but you can't yeah. stop betting on new chains that might become the next big one well, and especially when, what when multi chain is, is such an important factor in in pockets long term strategy, right? We want a hundred chains, two hundred chains, three hundred chains, but we don't want chains that are you know 
10 relays a day and cost more to maintain than they are to to you know um to to actually then what's actually being delivered in value to the network um michael's asking about uh, the source rewards that shane was talking about i think source rewards and and um uh like rebates to gateways. I think those are both interesting ideas on how to maintain the economic controls while also, you know, sort of assisting in the business development and business growth. Um, and especially with new chains and new gateways, I think those ideas, you know, we should probably work on a 90 day or, or 180 day sort of Kickstarter type program to help, um, you know, to help make sure that all new growth is actually healthy for the network and and to drive new business development. Uh, I think that's an important aspect to, to us continuing to grow in the future. Yeah, the one point I'll make here is uh, chain any chain doesn't have to be a burden on pocket. The only reason it's a burden on pocket is because only specific people are essentially able to run nodes within pocket which are large providers because of how the economics are when we have gandalf down to uh when we have gandalf down to one and in shannon when we have uh uh when we have an ability to essentially require nodes to be inside of a particular region what that means is anyone can run uh it, it doesn't matter how small of relays there are because any community member from any chain could just utilize pocket for their rpcs regardless of how big or small that uh uh you know that traffic is the problem right now is we have node runners that you know are looking at their own costs and being like okay out of the amount of chains that i have to run which ones are the most profitable which ones are not and then they want to drop the ones that are not profitable but that's because everything is dependent on essentially you know six node runners uh once we get to the point where any chain could just launch itself and say, hey, you know, Pocket already is a protocol that allows for this kind of payment of RPC. Let's get our node runners running uh, on this protocol, and then let's get our apps sending their relays through the Pocket protocol. Like, that's what po Pocket is meant to be. That's what it was meant to be from the beginning. So chains should be completely permissionless. Anyone should be able to join. Uh, and it doesn't matter how many relays you have, because uh, it, because anyone from any community could just, you know, s drop a, a pocket node next to their chain node and serve whatever traffic there is. They might be a validator where that node's already paid for through the validator, uh, through the validation of that network. Um, so they, they're not trying to, you know, uh, any relays are then just added on top of what they're already making. Or perhaps they're already in RPC business, already doing something in the uh, node space or an indexing business. It doesn't matter. Uh, they just drop a pocket node next to their chain node, and they can just start serving relays, regardless of how many are there or not there. So the only reason we're in this position now is because max chains is at 15, and you have geomeshing. That's the only reason we're kind of in this particular position where we have all of these chains that... All, node runners don't want to necessarily run all these different chains because we're locked into an economic system that only allows, you know, six major node runners. Um, so the ultimate vision of Pocket is much different than how it is today, and we should be able to unlock most of that uh, actually with the Shannon launch. And we can start unlocking it with Gandalf, which, again, by the end of the week, I'm hoping to have some uh, published. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that as well. We've uh, that's been passed for a little while now, but I've been curious to see like what the actual implementation plan of that's going to be. And it's I know it's been a meme that you know this is fixed in Shannon, but <laughs> there really is a lot fixed in Shannon. the The one thing I don't know is if it's going to be fixed in Shannon is uh, the regional staking. Basically, just like how you stake in uh, stake with particular chains, um, you can also stake. Uh, you also would stake in a particular region, and then sessions are created um, for that region. So that is a shift uh, from what it is in Morse. So I don't know if when Shannon launches, if 
that's going to be immediately available or not. I would imagine it's probably not, uh, but that could easily be one of the you know things added um, is the region staking. And then what that means is you don't have to run your node in three different regions to get network average. Uh, you can just run, you can literally get network average by running your node in your region, and that's it. Yeah, I'll just jump in real quick. Uh, this is not going to be available on Tenelon 100%. Uh, our goal is to migrate up more and just get permission with Taylor's out the door. So a lot of like, all, like tokenomics, you know, we'll improve it, scalability, we'll fix that. But all of the features that we want to iterate on, uh, those are all going to post mainnet in upgrade. Because one of the key features of Canon is being able to upgrade without the risk of the chain hold. Uh, because of the new foundation on which we're building. So there's going to be many more conversations post setup. And I want to call it out. I'd like to respond to something in the, um, the, the chat that Arthur posted. The, uh, and I know I've, I've had this conversation with you, Daniel, as well. Like, I just think about, like, when I think about that, the, the whole scaling to underpin all RPC traffic. I, I'm old enough to remember, like, the early days of the internet when some of these issues were kind of the same, you know, like back in the day before, um, you know, the internet, what it is today. Uh, concerns were, hey, who's paying for these routers? Who's paying for the bandwidth? You know, like I'm all for an open internet and everybody using it, but I'm bearing the costs. And, and in the early days, this was universities saying that, and uh, you know, maybe some bigger uh, commercial, uh, you know, providers. But um, it, and it's kind of like that today with Pocket. You know, you've got big node runners uh, that are bearing the costs, and you know, I've run nodes to understand the economics well enough where. You know, you can kind of say, like, I don't want to, I mean, you can make an argument that you could almost just, like, relay traffic for, like, two or three different chains right now and be profitable. And if you're looking at it just from a node runner's perspective, you know, being profitable, and I think the, you know, from a node runner's perspective, profitability is is what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to spend less than you're getting in rewards and uh, it's you know, it's a kind of three pieces. What's the value of a reward? You know, what's the cost of my in infrastructure? And, you know, how many relays am I getting? If you're trying to create like, you know, underpin everything, you still can't ignore the fact that there's economics someplace, somebody is gonna bear the costs. Uh, right now, uh, you, you can't like the, the the value of the traffic is the same for every single chain. You know, like I don't get more for relaying uh, for a, uh, a network that has less traffic. I don't get more per relay. Uh, you know, so there's there's no like incentive to, you know, to do that if you're looking at it profitability, you know, just from a profitability standpoint. I, I, and I don't know how else node runners under the current structure are going to look at it. But um, that was kind of a long response arthur to your comment but no no i yeah. i i i agree with you I, i'm just saying there is this world hypothetical world that we're going to like we all want to get to where we have the implementation uh that the gandalf implementation where we have a, a more of a minimum stake to allow for a lot more nodes to exist across the board at least at the pocket level and where we have um related whatever we're calling it at this point but having some dynamic bartering system between gateways uh, and nodes where we can kind of price each node based on relay pressure, price each relay based on the amount of pressure coming into the network. But we're not there yet. And uh, we're just telling you as a gateway, the issues that we're seeing. So if every, and, and I, I've always tried to be as transparent as I'm able to, to be just to say like, we are yes. now at the point, growth is now at the point where we cannot be supporting the long tail of chains and we're going to do what we can to support as many as possible. But there is that threshold that you're in, referencing 
where the amount that we need to spend to support a chain and the amount it costs of node runners to support a chain, that gap is too wide and does not make sense. The examples that came up were ZK Sync and OptiNB. Those are two chains that we just had to terminate support for because of that wide gap. Um, and I think all the things that should come up should be should fix this, but we're not there yet. And I just wanted to bring it up today because this is a near term concern. And uh, operating the business, I worry about the near term concerns right now. I mean, I, I, I think this is one of the most important topics, in my opinion, uh, in sort of the the network wide. I mean, this this just is kind of just coming to a head. Like when you have to turn off chains, it's it's kind of a good thing because it forces that. Okay, like when is a chain worth uh, supporting? And and it's like you you can't really. It, it, how's that saying go? Um, we're we're losing money on every unit, but we'll make it up in volume. <laughs> no, you won't. If you know if you're losing money on every unit, you're going to just lose more money as volume goes up. Uh, you know, so um, I I think this is really good that you're bringing this up now because it 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 sort of forces a, a deeper conversation around like even if you like you being Grove, you you offload to to PNF, it doesn't change the underlying issue. The underlying issue is that it's not profitable. It, you're, you're just shifting the losses and, and you right. know, maybe PNF can ship them to a node runner at, you know, and, and one node runner will get smart enough and, and they'll ship them to a, a node runner that's less experienced, but the issue doesn't go away. Right, I mean, I'm just thinking about how other foundations in general or this ecosystem operates, right? The, the, there's an organization in the middle that bootstraps the ecosystem for extended periods of time via grants of different sorts, via retroactive funds and um, and so on and so forth. And there is no guarantee that there's going to be a one-for-one -one economic gain, one that is directly relatable, but there is an indirect exposure that comes out of it um, or marketing exposure that comes out of it. Like, as I was saying, like there are these long tails of chains that I don't think are ever going to survive, right? I don't believe we need all these chains to exist. But they do exist and we do, the fact that we can advertise that we support it does at from time to time bring in customers that are like, hey, I came to you because of, I don't know, some chain that I can't, I, whatever, whatever low level chain that we, we currently support. Let's say ZK Link, something new, or Radix, Radix being at the very bottom. I came to you because of Radix, but oh, I actually also need to work on X, Y, and Z because a lot of our customers are multi-chain customers. They're not single purpose customers. So being able to market this, that you can, I consider this more from like a marketing perspective, like this, the usage of these funds, where the, the, the return is indirect, not direct. I'm not sure if there's a better way to word it. Yeah, no, I, and, and I agree with you 100%. Like marketing wise, it's the right way to go. Um, it, it, it probably just needs a, a, a little more depth. You know, it might be like in the small print, yeah, it's free, but like at some point you, you have to reach this level for us to continue doing yeah. this because we're making an investment. And I'm, I'm not, you know, like, I, I don't know the specifics around how that ought to read, but, but it needs to be in there somehow, you know, like where just like AWS or whatever, they, they've got like their free tier, you know, and, and everybody does, but like, in, in, if you're part of their startup, whatever they call their, you know, thing to get startups on board, you know, their, their hope is that you're paying for traffic, not that they're giving it away to you forever. And so they have in the small print, if you've ever read those things, like they can pull the plug on that at any point if you don't reach a certain level. And some version of that probably needs to exist would, would be my so guess. Fun, funny enough, we did something like this um, back in Q2. We changed the way we price. So a lot of the customers that we have are white glove enterprise style customers. Like we had a small sales team and they would go out, go out cold reach out, and then periodically we would get conversions. And... We changed the pricing because customers weren't meeting these minimums such that flat they have to flat out pay for 100 million requests per month um and i think we were charging 250 so like two and fifty cents a million which is very very cheap but it's basically what some of the competitors are charging but we were giving like that was just a way to sign them on and if they go beyond 100 million they would then pay more and you know they pay a different rate depending on how much more they would but we at least guarantee some traffic or some level of traffic we but we are charging the way we have been charging is across the board it's not on a per chain basis because it's it, i don't think we want to get to the business of 
just charging for use of um, Cosmos chains or just starting of using test nets or just archivals. It just doesn't feel well. It makes the value prop that much more difficult for people to use us. Um, so we did implement like implement that, but that again, isn't going to be enough to move the needle here either, which is why I, I kind of have brought up the topic today. And I appreciate having this friendly discourse back and forth and you, you seeing where we're coming from. Yeah. And, and I, um, again, I, like I agree, there needs to be, there needs to be a free tier. I'm, I'm definitely not saying uh, that there's not, I, I guess I'm just trying to, uh, I mean, there's a cost, you know, and, and somebody's going to bear that cost. I mean, it's, it's, it's using long tail, uh, marketing strategies with products that uh, I'm referring to the chains as products that, that have hard costs does, doesn't work just like in, in economics in most cases, because unless your cost of uh, sales is less than your cost of carry, you're going to lose money. So like there just needs to be some like mechanism for like you just described for like, offboarding the the change at, at some sure. period of time because with that you could build a model around all right you know we 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 think that you know it's it, this number of chains are, are are gonna like get to this point over this period of time i mean at least you can start running some scenarios to to see what you could possibly do um but if they're just there forever you're just going to accumulate more technical debt or not technical debt, but, but chain debt. I, I don't know what the right term is, but you, you'll just keep growing the problem unless there's a way to, to do what you're doing with those chains that aren't working. And, and sure. Probably... So, so you have the right of it. We, we consider each chain a new product, right? And that is how we think about it as well internally, because that's exactly this. Um, and I agree at some point you have to kill these products. I, I guess where I personally worry is that we haven't proactively sat down and tried to kill chains often because, again, the metric, as Fred said, that everyone looks at is relay number go up. Um, but now economics, the economic conditions have basically forced us to do this, and I just worry about what this portends moving forward. That's all. I, I mean, the, the I, I don't know that you could have had a good conversation about it until the economic conditions force it, right? Because you're kind of learning as you go. And maybe this is, you know, the conversation, this is exactly the right time to have it because this is the first time it's gotten to the point where you go, oh, like this doesn't make any kind of sense. You know, it's sort of like, I, I think of an, an analogy, like, you know, imagine you, you own a store and you've gotten to the point where every single shelf is just full of product, you know, where you can't even put one more thing on the shelf. That's the time to go, are all these products selling, you know, because- sure. You know, you know, you really just don't know until that point. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know that we we could have really had an intelligent conversation around it before getting to the point where some of them are just clearly not working. Right. And I, I think uh, I don't know how much time there is. Uh, we're almost at the end. I think the last thing I'll say to this, because I know we're kind of getting over is uh, and this is kind of to the community at, at large. Like over the last two years, what we did is we basically we built a, you know, a version of Infura or Alchemy or whatever you want on, on a Web3 backend, which hasn't really been done. And it costs that money and that time and that experimenting to get us to where we are today. But we knew the entire time that these other providers have all these value add services, be it these orchestration SDKs that, you know, that, uh, that orchestrate a bunch of NFT APIs or have caching or indexing built in or these other features built in that we do not or have the flexibility to build out um, built on top of growth. So growth's value prop is to prove out that you, that, you know, that you can generate demand, consistent demand, and drive traffic through something like Pocket. And we've proven that. And my thesis and our thesis now has always been, like because we've all believe it, right, especially the folks who are still here, that we should be spending more time trying to get more gateways on board because we, like, we've proven literally that you cannot do everything as a small team. And the belief is that other gateways or, think, or entities that we call gateways, but they may not necessarily be gateways, will want to end up settling as much traffic as possible. So one of the things that gets to me is we're kind of going against that thesis because we're the one entity right now that's trying to service all of this, and we can't. And the other gateways, 
they're not servicing a lot of these chains because just the quality of service just isn't there. And what we're trying to do is enable all of them moving forward. So the last two years have basically been an experiment in trying to gin up demand and drive it. And I think we succeeded to some degree. And now we have, you know, 95, 96% of that traffic is paid. And I mean, paid as in Grove gets fiat for it. Um, uh, and we are now kind of moving to this new world. Where we're going to try to help uh, build upon what Nodis has built and offer an, an alternative client. And then hopefully start driving even more gateways into the mix. And I just hope that because we are still in this infancy that doing things like removing things from our shelves, using your analogy, Steve, we're not shooting ourselves in the foot, which is why I brought it up today. So I can stop there, but I just want to kind of give you guys where my framing is coming from. And I had more thought, I just, I want to clock straight up, but on, on that, like um, something else will come out of it because uh, it, it is like it, to use, that analogy of the internet again. In the beginning, the you know the the conversation was all around like how do we make these companies running these routers profitable, like selling traffic. But what nobody really realized is um, there was new business models that were going to make a lot more than routing the traffic, and so like they could just give it away at losses. So so right now to hopefully make that analogy make sense. We're looking at a business model where the gateways make money, you know, just selling relays. There might be things, Arthur, that we haven't even seen yet. And uh, I had before all the stuff, you know, happened with, uh, you know, recent weeks, uh, I had applied to, to run a gateway. And, and my thought was not to sell relays at all but to sell like another service that would depend on those relays. So a completely different model. Uh, and, and those might exist where it, it, we might not have to make in every single case the, the Grove model profitable. And I'm using the Grove model like based on what, what you're doing today or the Nodi's model profitable. Um, enabling this is going to also enable uh, new models that we, we might not know about now that are going to change the economics of like how it all works. I, I agree. That's why I, I kind of, I was doing air quotes, but the term gateway does not mean what it means today. And I, I think we all know that. And I think you're, you're basically saying that as well. Um, so I a hundred percent agree with you. And I think to your analogy, right, all the infrastructure that was built in the, around the dot-com era didn't end up really being really useful until the mobile era showed up and everyone needed all that infrastructure uh, to uh, all at once. And it wasn't enough at that point. And I, I think this is where I'm coming from, where like there is a time and market and like outlet, you know, surviving in this market is what we basically have to do. And we're doing everything we can to make sure that does happen to get to that point where there is this mm -hmm. use cases that we don't know exist already do come into fruition and existence and we can, we are ready to support it. This history does rhyme. Yeah, I think that that word you use, survive, that's the key. Like, just stay alive long enough for it to figure itself out, and then then it'll all come together. So it, it is just, like, stay in the game. We are definitely uh, a few minutes after the top of the hour, and it's an important conversation. I'm glad that we've spent some time on it today. I'm uh, looking forward to Shane's write-up on our implementation strategy for Gandalf and, and uh, some greater participation in the ecosystem about uh, how we put all these pieces together. So that's it for us for this week. We'll see you again same time next week, same channel, Wednesday at noon. Thanks, everybody.